Hi there, uh, I'm Mike McAvoy, I'm Head of Factual at Two Rivers Media, and welcome to our panel Guru Guide Your TV Career, part of the Guru Live Online Spring 21 programme, BAFTA Scotland's Festival for New Talent, where we'll be celebra celebrating and hopefully inspiring the next generation of Scottish talent during a week of special events and masterclasses. The session today, which I'll be chairing, will focus on those important first steps to kickstart and develop your career in television. So some housekeeping, uh, these virtual events are part of BAFTA's learning work to share expertise from film, games and televisions with audiences far and wide. So be sure to check out BAFTA.org and BAFTA's social channels for more activity and news. You can also join the conversation on social using hashtag Guru Live. Also, this is a Q&A session, so please, please, please ask questions. Uh, please send them in via the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll try to answer as many as we can, if we know the answers, it could be mysterious questions. Uh, closed captioning is available now, which you can turn on at the bottom of your screen. So you do that if you need to. And finally, please welcome our speakers. We are joined by Laura Mackay, who is the Talent Manager at IWC Media. Sarah Harkins, who's a training manager at Outlander, and Ryan Passy, who's content producer at BBC The Social. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Brilliant. Thanks very much for joining us on what is the most miserable day I think I've ever seen with my eyes. <laughs> God doesn't like elections. Um, so, um, first question. Um, so I'll go around to you all, because I suppose we're talking about what is how to get into television, how to start a career. So I'd quite like to ask you, each of you um, to give us a kind of brief overview of how you started in television. So um, Sarah, could you kick us off with how you got into telly? Um, so I, I'm, I'm from a place called Kinloch Bovey, which is in the very far northwest um, of Scotland, really as far up as you can get. So um, was brought up on a sheep farm. Um, and didn't really have, well, didn't, no, not didn't really, didn't have any knowledge of film and television, but I did do kind of theatre and TV stuff at, at uni and kind of thought actually that might be really interesting um, to get into, but didn't have a clue. Um, but read an article in a paper about a studio in Glasgow called Black Cat Studios, sent my CV to Black Cat Studios. Paddy Hickson, who is still a hugely important um, individual in the film and television industry in Scotland kept my CV and I got my first job because the producer was so surprised that on my CV that I could um, shear a sheep and had worked as a fisherman, which is all I'd done at that point. But they thought, well, you know, she's probably resilient. So let's give her a, give her a shot. And that's how I started. Brilliant. Uh, Ryan, how did you get started? Um, well, like most people, it kind of took a totally different track into it. But I, I um, worked mainly in like bars and restaurants for most of my kind of teenage life and then um, went to uni and did like marketing and economics and swiftly decided that was absolutely nothing I wanted to do when I was actually starting a career. Um, and so I went on a few different schemes like um, Jump Cut and The Network, which was run through the TV festival. And through that, I got a job at um, Razor Roof Productions as a production secretary. So it was directly through the scheme. And from there, just kind of went on through production roles as a coordinator. And then eventually, after about a year and a half or two years, I think, moved to the BBC. And kind of then from there, really found the thing that I wanted to do, which was um, as a researcher on the social when I've been there for the last sort of five, five years. Brilliant. And Laura, how did you get into this world? Um... Yeah, bit of an odd, bit of an odd route as well. I think um, most people have a, a slightly circuitous route into this industry sometimes. Certainly they did um, when I was starting out. Um, my background is actually live sport. So I got my first job basically because my friend recommended me because he was moving on to a different job and knew that I wanted to get into the TV and um, being a big sports fan it kind of all just fell into place for me. Um, so I started with STV in their sport department um, and worked there for 10 years and kind of worked my way up. I started as a sports assistant, so just kind of general 
um, general duties really, um, kind of looking after the video library when we still had tapes, <laughs> um, looking after the video library and um, kind of straight into an edit suite actually. So I was um, I was really lucky. I kind of got, got straight into kind of hands-on production straight away. Um, and I continued to do that for about 10 years until I had my family. And um, that was when I started um, talent manager role at IWC. So I've, I've got kind of, um, I've been really lucky that I've kind of had two um, TV careers really, if you like. But um, yeah, sport, I still, I still do a bit of sport as well. So yeah, that was me. One thing that, you know, I've done quite a few of these sessions in the past and, you know, we all talk about different ways we get into television. What is what is fascinating to me is that there is such a number of different ways and I think everybody thinks their way is kind of circuitous and unique and all that, but I think it is just because there are so many different opportunities and different projects and different genres that you kind of, sometimes you can't help but pinball into the, the industry. It's not It's not like, you know, you're not like an apprentice electrician and then you get to start doing yeah. this and then you can start, it is, they're all very different uh, different roles. One thing that I think is often overlooked and we've got a good mix of genres here and and, uh, and mediums, but one thing I think is often overlooked is sport, you know, in television because, you know, drama and factual sometimes meet because we have similar ideas or we do factual dramas and things and online you know you're, you're in among, amongst them but the sport very much is a different world often yeah production companies laura how how many what would you say about, what would you say that sport television offers people that want to get into this business uniquely I think there's there's a whole range of stuff that you can that you can do and you can learn on a kind of live sport broadcast um, and also pre-recorded stuff, you know, so it, it kind of draws on actually a lot of the other genres, you know, you can be doing stuff in studio, you can be doing stuff on an outside broadcast, live at an event, um, you know, the majority of times the production staff, the editorial production staff are basically doing a bit of everything, so you're you're in an edit suite, you're overseeing voiceovers, um, you know, you're you're kind of making editorial judgments on what makes it into a highlights package on any particular sport or event. Um, you know, so you're you're kind of involved in in a lot of different areas where maybe on on a factual production, you know, if you were an edit producer, you would just be in the edit, so you're not actually seeing all the other kind of component parts of the production um so yeah you know it's it's um it's quite varied um and you know like like most things to get into the kind of sport broadcasting side of things it's you know you, you, everybody kind of starts as a runner um you know and, and making the tea and running about with team sheets and that kind of thing you know and making sure that everybody's got everything what you know whatever they need um but yeah I think what, what I have found in my role as a talent manager is that people who come from a sport production background have a vast array of transferable skills into other genres as well you know because they have spent their life in an edit suite they have spent their life in and out of a studio or running in and out of of an OB truck or you know whatever it may be so um, yeah, it's 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 a kind of good all rounder um, in in sport. I, suppose, I think. I suppose sports a is such a hungry beast. There's a lot of sport out there it's in the same similar way that I got started in television in daytime television because I was a hungry beast. I had to make programs every week. We had a you know an hour or sometimes two hours of television to fill. So you needed quite a lot of people to do that, and it does. Yeah fast turnaround and things so it's um, sometimes people should be considering how they get into television is actually to look at the the, the genres and mediums that have the most the most to offer say that I would say that the drama sometimes is seen as the the most exclusive of all these genres and all that what do you think of it getting into that world I mean one thing I was going to just pick up on what Laura was saying you were about sport is I think what's maybe a really good starting point is what are you interested in 
So you've identified that you want to potentially work in film and TV, but what actually is your interest? Is it sport? Are you interested in makeup um, and hair? Is it costume? Um, you know, are you really good with kind of graphic design? You know, what are the different things that you as an individual really are interested in and are good at? And that's often a really good starting point to start thinking about where you should go. So is it focusing on trying to get into sport? Is it focusing on drama? You know, do you love historical drama when you watch it on television? So maybe that's where you want to try and focus on. And I think actually having that kind of um, understanding of what will be of most interest to you, that's a really good place to start. And there are, there's basically a job, and certainly in drama, and, and also in factual, and you know, I've worked in children's a lot as well, but um, anything you're interested in, you will find, you know, cooking, you could be a, you know, we've got brilliant caterers on the production I'm working on at the moment. Really anything at all you're interested in, you could find a, a role in television. But, you know, as, as Mick and Laura are saying, you know, it could be children's, it could be drama, it could be sport. It, there's just so many different places to go, for sure. And, and drama wise, um, there are, you know, a number of training schemes on a number of dramas. Um, I think, you know, there, there are, I know that BAFTA have got an amazing um, handout sheet that they're going to be giving out at the end, and that will point you in the direction of, of lots of um, training kind of um, companies or, or kind of things like Back to Vision who, might, who can, can help you, you know, to start off, and they're very scripted focus. Um, so I don't think drama is any more difficult than any other genre. I think in order to learn drama, it's the same as doing well in sport, on the or whatever, you need to be enthusiastic um, and positive and a good team player. One of the best questions I was ever asked in a Q&A was, um, uh, it was the first question I was asked at this particular Q&A and the question was, what's it like? And I thought it was one of the best. <laughs> it just it became a bit, a bit of an existential question for me and I started questioning everything. But it is, what's it like to be in television? So just to focus that slightly, and I'll start with you, Ryan, is that what should people expect from that kind of first, first one or two years in television what what is it like to start off in television yeah i think um it's a, that is a really good existential crisis question <laughs> i think i think for for me it was quite weird because i'd never really worked in an office like during the day and stuff i'd done lots of kind of bar work and restaurant stuff and like call center work at night and things but it, it was quite an adjustment i think doing like a proper sort of working office hours and stuff and I think like, yeah, I just found it all quite, quite weird, to be honest, when I first started. I think like the the things I like loved about it was the kind of, the being part of a team and the sort of like camaraderie around it and the, the sort of pressure around it as well. Um, I think it, it is a, it can be a really high pressure environment. You're, you're working to quite tight deadlines sometimes on, on pretty small budgets, depending what genre you're in and what, what kind of broadcaster you're going for and stuff. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it is a high pressure environment when you're running up to shoot something. So it totally depends on what role you're in. You know, for me as a production secretary, it, it really gave me like a really good overview of um, everything that was going on. And I could sort of see everyone like rushing around and, and working away and stuff. So I think like it, it was it was brilliant to kind of get that obser observation in that sort of role. But yes, it's, it's, it's a really, that's a really tricky question I and mean, everywhere is totally different. Like from the first place I worked at was uh, an indie called Raise the Roof and that compared to working in Factual and the BBC was, was like night and day, it was completely different. So it, you know, there's, I think every indie has its own, its own style and own culture and stuff that they sort of set. And I think like, you know, you, you'll find like teams that you fit in really well with and other teams where it's, you know, it just depends on what you're making. But I think, you know, Sarah, you made a really good point about like, like finding the stuff that you like love to make and what you're interested in is if you find a, a company that is making stuff that you like you'll probably just like you'll love it and you can bring so much to the team I think it is a really important point I think actually just look watching television wait until the credits sometimes can be so important to actually work out you know if you like really like the program thought I would like to make that you know stick around and wait to find out who made it and then contact them there because we've got actually in Scotland you know, there's such a wide array of, um, you know, indies out there, you know, then, and it, you know, companies like STV Productions is making up just, I think, started a new drama yesterday uh, for Channel 4. 
so there's a wider array. So fortunately, BAFTA has put together a brilliant um, sheet that um, they be able to be people to be able to get later on. Sarah, how what do you think people should expect in the first two years of going into the world of drama? So we started filming um, a drama a week past Monday. So for the there's quite a it's very busy at the moment in Scotland. So I think lots of new opportunities certainly in scripted. Um, and so we we did have indeed some brand new um, people join our team. And and I think they would have, I hope, um, had a combination of being part of a team and you know being briefed on day one and being given responsibility from day one um, and, and alongside a mixture of standing in the freezing cold and actually on Monday the freezing cold and torrential rain I had to kind of call a wrap at lunchtime because the weather was so appalling we couldn't film so getting wet being resilient long hours camaraderie never quite knowing what the next day is going to bring let alone the next kind of hour is going to bring I suppose just being really, you know, being open to just doing, doing what you're asked, listening, um, asking questions if you don't know. Um, but I think that's kind of what makes it such an amazing job. That I mean, that's for me. I love the unpredictability of it. That I never quite know what I'm going to be do dealing with, what issues are going to come up, what problems I've got to solve, um, and that's that's the same whether you're an exec producer a training manager or a production runner. No, completely. I think television's brilliant for people that have a low boredom threshold. <laughs> even if, if you start making something thinking, this is not really lighting my fire, something will come along soon that will. You know, it's, and you do, there's such a big array of programmes you could be making, you know, no matter what the, the genre. Laura, you're the talent manager at IWC, so you, you see a lot of people coming in at the entry level. IWC, your your company makes a lot of you know high volume um, series as well, uh, such as location, location, location. Yeah. What, do, what do you see uh, people going into that uh, kind of into high intense you know factual world? What do you think it's like for them in the first couple of years? I think it's it's probably um, yeah, it's a bit of a, a culture shock. I think you know um, I don't know if. Um, you know, you've experienced this. I think when I tell people that I work in television, they think it's all really glamorous and yes. you meet loads of famous people and it's and it's great. Um, 20 years I've been waiting for the glamour. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, you know, but more often than not, it's like what Sarah's talking about, you're standing in the cold and rain. And, uh, um, mm. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's busy. You know, when, when we are making, for example, location, 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 um, you know, it's it's a, a long schedule. Um, they, it's it's quick turnaround though. You know, we're making a lot of episodes in in a year, um, and really, what what we are looking for, you know, for example, in a researcher, um, or somebody who is coming in to do a the fact checking for one of the episodes to make sure everything is correct at the time of um broadcast and that kind of thing is someone who is confident um can absolutely work as part of that team because it's been going for a very long time now we've you know we've just had our 20th anniversary so it's a well-oiled machine you know all the systems are in place and you know you're looking for someone who can kind of slot in effortlessly really and and take direction well um, and not be afraid to ask questions, um, you know, and just really get get your head down and and kind of get amongst it, really, um, you know. And I, so I think with that being such a well established show, it can be slightly daunting for for new people coming into those teams um, because you think, oh, everybody else knows what they're doing, and and maybe I'm not quite assured and you know but it's you just have to remember that every single other person who's on that team has been in, in your position so they know exactly what you're experiencing speak to them you know you're, you're part of the team ask questions um and if there's anything that you're a bit unsure about then you know someone will be able to answer your question um and just not to try not to get overwhelmed I suppose um 
by by a new environment, a new project, and and you know just believe believe in yourself and believe that you can you can do it and you can contribute um, really well to to that team and and contribute to something you can be proud of at the end. Because I think you know it is easy to be overwhelmed once you see the equipment and the people and the biz around you, and you know I think television often. We all, many of us suffer from imposter syndrome, you know, and it that doesn't quite go away. I still get it. I'm 20 years on it. I'll be, I've been executing, um, Absolutely. Season, you know, 12 years. And now and again, I'll be in a situation going, how, how did I get here? They're going to find me out now. <laughs> the moment when I'll be revealed to me. <laughs> but it's nonsense. You just, you know, you're, you're, you should be there. You, if you work hard, you're good at it and you love it. So we've got uh, some brilliant questions have been coming in. Listen to me, I sound like a radio DJ from the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> so some really good uh, questions come in. A lot of them to do with CVs and any pet peeves on CVs. Um, you know, what should be in there? How do you recommend getting the right work experience? Laura, as a talent manager, we often imagine that you'll be you'll be just constantly in a flood of CVs coming to you. Where, what are the kind of classic rights and wrongs that you see with the world of CVs? Um, so with CVs, yes, I mean, I'm see, I see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of CVs on a weekly basis, um, you know, which is great because that's what I want to see. Um, but I think um, where people kind of fall into a bit of a trap is just overthinking it, really, you know, and there's, there's no requirement. I mean, I think the best advice I can give really in terms of creating your CV is not to overthink it, just keep it simple, um, you know, clear, concise, a clear font, easy to read, um, you know, it doesn't need to be super fancy, um, you know, a, a, a CV for TV jobs is, I always think, a slightly different animal from, you know, a kind of CV that you would submit for any other kind of job really um, you know we deal very much in facts you know, we want to know who you are where you are what you would like to do you know so it's it's contact details where you're based um, job titles so you know if you're open to runner roles production assistant roles you know put all of that at the top of your your CV um, please make sure you put a phone number on it. Um, we don't need to know your address, but just ideally, if you say Glasgow based, Stirling based, Edinburgh based, London based, whatever you may be in the in the country, um, then that's just really useful. If it's you know a kind of quick turnaround thing that we're looking for somebody who can turn up tomorrow, and we know that you're close by. Um, yeah, you know we we don't need kind of big old paragraphs um, about who you are, what you do, what you like, all of that kind of thing. You know, a couple of sentences is more than enough as a personal profile to just give us a bit of a flavour of kind of who you are and where your interests lie, um, what kind of jobs um, in an ideal world you're, you're looking for. Um, I'm a big fan of bullet points. Uh, bullet points just make me very happy um, you know obviously if you're just coming into the industry we are not expecting lists of credits or you know volumes of experience in, in this industry that's okay you know because that we're not expecting that um, you know but things that it might be useful to put on there is you know I always think that people who have worked in hospitality or retail or call centres, stuff like that, who are in kind of public facing roles, um, you know, that, that kind of just proves to us that you're successful communicators, um, you can work as part of a team, you can take direction, you know, so all of these things are relevant um, and, and just, you know, kind of useful information for us because obviously your CV is your kind of stepping stone or your, your first introduction um, to any of the companies um, and what's on your CV is obviously what's 
going to kind of encourage us to, to get in touch with you directly then um, for any particular role that we're looking for. Um, and also with that, you know, kind of cover letters is, um, is another big area where people, again, kind of get a bit overwhelmed and think, oh, you know, what do I need to put in there? What do I need to write? All of that kind of thing. Again, you know, it's just, it's a simple introduction as long as it's spelled correctly and it's all grammatically correct. That makes me very happy. Um, and, you know, again, just a, a bit of a flavour. Um, if you're responding to a kind of advertised job role, then, you know, read the advert again. Make sure you're answering any of the questions that have been asked or any of the specifics that the role advertised has, you know, kind of requested, basically. You know, so, for example, if it's, let's say it's a, it's a runner role and um, you need to be able to drive, for example, or quite often with these, certainly the driving roles, and it's not, not exclusive for runners at all, but quite often for driving roles, you need to be over a particular age just to be insured on the production cars. Um, you know, so if, if it's been kind of listed in the advert, these are the kind of things that we need to know, or this would be preferable, or the answer the questions in the cover letter and let us know so that we can instantly see, right, oh, brilliant, that's, that's good, you're ticking all the boxes there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, that's probably a bit too much, that's a bit of information overload there, but um, I think they're the kind of main main areas that, that certainly I'm looking for. And put the I person's think, name on it, the dear, dear, dear sir stroke madam. Yeah, absolutely. That's, yes, that's uh -huh. always an error. Find out yeah. who you're, you're talking to. Can I add something, Rick? I think, you know, yeah. if, if, if Han and... Oh. oh, sorry, I think I've frozen. Sarah, you were going to say something, sorry? I was going to say something, a really elementary thing. Um, so we get loads and loads of CVs on Outlander oh. um, and people don't name their CV. So if you can imagine, I get, say, you know, at the last recruitment, we had thousands of people applying and none of them actually, you know, when you click on the document and go into the CV, you can see the individual's name. But actually, as a document, it's not got somebody's name on it. And that's just really, really difficult um, to manage. So please make sure it doesn't just say CV. Um, it says Sarah Harkin CV or whatever. And, and I completely agree with everything Laura said, I mean, but I, I can't emphasize enough the transferable skills. So, you know, the fact that you've, if you've not got any experience in the industry, that's not a disaster, but putting on any transferable skills that you have, any work experience that you've got is really important. So, you know, as Laura's saying, the hospitality stuff, um, I just, there was a, somebody who we needed a, a location runner, person came in, set got CV, the individual hadn't done kind of um, any film and TV work, but they had done events and gardening and kind of stuff outside. And immediately I, would, I read that and I thought, well, they can definitely do the job and they could. So just, um, and, and school stuff, you know, don't worry about listing your schools. Um, and if you want to put on any other education, that's fine if you want to put it on, but but I think it's your transferable skills that are probably will be the most important thing. Yeah, Ryan, you were saying you worked in the hospitality trade, and that's where I, I did as well uh, when I was a student, and even after student, I was in the hospitality for a while. And I often say, well, I often bore people with the thing. I just say I learned more working behind a bar in Kilmarnock that's helped me in television than I did at university. This is probably why I don't get asked to do anything for Glasgow Caledonian, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Ryan, your BBC Social is um, set up as not only to be a, a great place for viewers to go and see great content, but it's almost seen as a kind of entry level for new talent, both in front of the camera and behind the camera. What's when people approach you? What should they What should they be doing, and what are, what occasionally do you see people getting wrong? Um, I think so. To get involved in the socials, pretty easy. You, there's just a there's a link on that doc that will get sent out and stuff. And if you message on, on Facebook, you'll just get like a um, an auto response with this link that lets you go into it and sort of fill out a basic kind of bunch of questions and stuff. But I think the the main thing that we're always looking for is people who are passionate about something, who have like a story to tell, whether that is that they want to be a filmmaker and, and more documentary stuff or, or there's a 
a special thing that they're really interested in. I think like the kind of mistake we see is when people clearly haven't watched anything on the social before. They've maybe seen a couple of, of big hits, but they're approaching us and maybe haven't, you know, it's really important to take that time and actually watch the stuff. It doesn't mean that you need to replicate all that, but it, it will give you a sense of the kind of things that we're making and the style of production and stuff. And I think that totally applies for TV. If you're, if you're messaging an indie, you should know the programs they make and be able to say something about it because you might get asked and it's it's a pretty big ready if you like can't say anything about it you've never seen it so <laughs> like I think um that's that's definitely the case for the social as well I think like the one of the things that I've seen is p- people kind of come in and they they maybe are like a bit worried about like pigeonholing themselves as well and I think this probably comes across for for tv stuff as well like that they they maybe come in and they make they want to make one thing and they think that's the only thing they can do but actually like we're interested in people who've got like lots of different types of ideas and then um, you know certainly for like for myself when I was trying to get in I didn't really want to work in production management but that was the thing that came up and that was like my way in and one of the reasons that I, I left Razor Roof is because I wanted to work in development and there was just more I just knew that there'd be more opportunities to do that at the BBC so I think like yeah, the, you might approach some somewhere like the social to make a particular type of, of video or or like a, a type of genre, but you're definitely not restricted to that. And, you know, you, you're sort of only restricting yourself. If you, you the thing that I always ask people is like, what are you interested in? If they've come and told me that they're passionate about um, something really specific, then I'll always ask them about other things that they're into, because quite often there's something really interesting there that, that they might not have thought about the, that I would find interesting one to make and stuff, so. Oh, completely. Can I just pick up on something there? I mean, I think what you're saying, Ryan, about, you know, actually doing your research and and um, being interested in or, or being knowledgeable about whatever it is you're applying for. Um, so on Outlander, we, we, you know, we get loads of um, applications for our training scheme, and then we shortlist usually about 10 to 15 people per role. And you would be astonished, well, I'm astonished at the amount of people that we interview who know nothing about Outlander, have never watched an episode, are not interested in television. And, you know, I just find that kind of astonishing. You don't need to like it. You know, I'm not saying you would need to like the show, but to have, you know, I think for me, it's about, you know, if if, if I'm taking the time to, to interview you, then please you take the time to have done a wee bit of research and and demonstrate that you have got an interest and yeah, yeah an interest in, in working in, in the industry that I'm working in. And 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 think and if you think it through, say if we've interviewed 15 people, and even if you are the very best candidate, but you've said, I've not watched Outlander, I don't want, really want to work in television drama, I want to work in whatever. Is that going to make me, as the hiring manager, think, well, this is the person that we should invest in for nine months of the year? Probably it's not. So I think it's about, you know, I'm not telling, you know, absolutely you shouldn't lie about your, you know, enthusiasm or whatever, but don't don't apply for jobs that you genuinely don't want to do um, and, and do the research. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I think it's it seems such an obvious, straightforward thing, but I think so many people are just, yeah, they apply for everything, but yeah, don't really want to do it um, and can't demonstrate any, you know, I, I remember one person I said, so, okay, so that's fine. You've not watched Outlander. Um, so what other, what other dramas do you like? I don't watch drama. <laughs> Why do you want to work in film and television? I don't know. And, and you, you do get people who do that. I think you can prepare for interviews as well. And you can, there are so often so many stock questions you get asked mm-hmm. and, you know, some of those, you know, you can have a wee toolkit for your interview, can't you? I'm sure Laura would give advice about that. But, you know, among, I mean, I know, for instance, our production designer in the art department, one of his questions is always, what, what are your three favourite films or TV dramas? So you know, that's the kind of question that you might get asked. So you can have that pre-prepared so that you're not kind of taken by surprise. Yeah. You know, Enthusiasm and interest. Yeah, I, I think it's really, really important that, you know, like, just echoing what, what Sarah's saying, you know, so many people that come in to me don't watch TV. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm kind of aghast at that slightly. 
I'm like, but you, you, you have to watch TV, watch everything, you know, obviously start with the stuff that you're really, really interested in, but maybe like once every couple of weeks, just watch something completely random that you wouldn't yeah. normally watch. Um, you know, and I think it's really important to remember that the industry in Scotland, like Mick was saying earlier on, there's such a vast array of different genres, different things happening here now um, that what what I find on um, CVs who come from people who are based in Glasgow is that they're far more eclectic, you know, and, and have to be kind of adaptable and, and do different things and work and you know so people could be working on a quiz show and then come to us and be a, a specialist factual kind of you know on a, on a history documentary researcher and then go to drama and that you know and there's current affairs whatever it may be um whereas obviously you know down south the, the cvs look very different because there's kind of i suppose more opportunity to be much more niche and, and just kind of specialise in one area. But in Glasgow, you know, it's all the skills are the same. It's just the content that changes. Um, but you can you can basically kind of dot about and do lots and lots of different things. So it's really important to kind of understand and have at least a kind of baseline knowledge of what those genres are and and kind of how they how they kind of operate. Um, you know, you don't need to obviously have an in-depth knowledge at all, but yeah, just watch daily, watch lots and lots of telly because that's your research. That's mm-hmm. that's what I tell myself anyway when I'm watching lots and lots of, lots of telly. <laughs> it shouldn't be that much of a chore watching telly. It's quite good. Exactly. exactly. Do it for fun, and then, but you're right. There's a huge, uh, there's a huge issue with people coming coming into television who don't watch television, and some people sometimes. People who get into television who stop watching television, mm-hmm. um, they, they can lose lose touch. I've I've worked for companies where you know the owners of the company have never you know never been watching the television. They, they, they read books and go to the theatre, and you're just like ah. And then they come up to you and they pitch you ideas about things that have been made. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I had a, the owner of a program pitch more or less Big Brother to me. <laughs> I'm afraid that's been made. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I, think, I think apart from the, um, you know, in an interview, being able to kind of just demonstrate demonstrate an interest, I think often as a runner or as a new person into the industry, you know, you could be, you could be the person picking up the director from, you know, the train station or taking them to the set or doing, you know, doing whatever. And, and I suppose it's about being able to have a conversation. And I think those conversations, you never know, you know, and it's even, it's maybe just kind of standing in the production office, having a chat with somebody, and you never know where those conversations go. So I was walking, so in the rain the other day at Wooten Ben Park, was walking back with um, a floor runner who happened to be talking to me about an idea um, that he'd developed, and he knows you, Ryan, and it's an interesting idea, and I, you know, he was telling me about it, and I'm like thinking, well, that's quite interesting, and he's now sent me the the pitch document and I might be coming, you know, so, and you just never know where all those networks kind of happen, but being able to have that ability just to chat and it doesn't need to be highbrow, you know, it can be about Love Island, it could be about the election, it could be about whatever it is, but I suppose it's just that kind of ability to kind of say, yeah, I I can talk about stuff to do with the industry I'm working in or I want to work in. See, that bleeds on very well to a question we've got in from a guy called Owen, who's, I'm lucky enough to be starting my first studio runner role next week since leaving the journalism industry. What tips do you have for your first studio role and how would you approach networking on the shoot so that you can secure your next gig? Ryan, how would you get back to Ryan? Uh, Owen, sorry. Um, I was just reading the question there. I've totally, like... I did not manage to comprehend what you were saying. So it's all right. No, <laughs> so he's, 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 he's going to be doing his first studio gig yeah. um, next week. It sounds like a first um, first job in television, although he's worked in journalism before. And he's just um, it's that question of how should he treat that that first gig? And he did say the word networking, which you know about how yeah. I suppose make an impression because networking can also make me fear that I'm being you know instead yeah. of. 
fucking working that they're actually pitching to me. Which yeah, is networking is such a dirty word, and but like it's it's like one of the most important skills I think you yeah. can have. I mean, you can get by without having to network, but I think it it definitely makes your life easier, and it's something I've always kind of embraced, I suppose. So yeah, coming into it, I think like the you 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 sort of if you don't let people know the stuff that you're interested in, then they, there's no way they can help you. So like say what you just said about someone kind of telling you about an idea like the fact they've done that means that something might happen with it so I think like people who um particularly when I w- was a coordinator and stuff and we were like new people coming with as a junior researcher or, or um runners and stuff the the people who kind of were able to then get their next role and stuff were generally people who were very engaged very proactive nice like it's it is there's there are there's so much going on but it can still be quite a tight-knit um industry in scotland and so like being sound is is really important and i think um yeah being able to ask questions i think that came up as well like yeah if you if you don't know something you have to ask and you you're not stupid for not knowing the answer if someone is a bit of a, a dick to you for not knowing something well that's more of a reflection on them than it is on you and i think Yes, there's, there's been cases when you, you've worked with people and stuff and and they, they just sit there and they don't do anything because they're so scared of, of, of asking you something. And it's really difficult to kind of get through that and stuff. And it, it's, that's a two-way thing that if you're working on a team and you know someone's new, that you it's also like our responsibility to make sure that we're like supporting that person. Yeah. But I think generally like kind of coming into a role from from something else, there's, like, there's a few questions about that, about like changing changing industry and stuff like that and I think it's that there's so much like transferable skills like I can't there's so there's so many people that I know that have kind of got into the industry that were doing completely different things but have kind of excelled in it and it doesn't it doesn't matter so much if you've got like so so many years experience in a completely other industry like you do bring so many transferable skills like if you've got that amount of time working in journalism to then come into this compared to someone who's, who's just starting like you've got bags more experience than those people and stuff. So I guess it's just kind of being um finding confidence in in what you what your experience is. And then also just not being afraid to talk to people. Like most people are like pretty nice and like in the industry and stuff. And and it, it is fun. I know I was talking earlier about it being pressure, but it's also like really fun to work in this industry and stuff. And it's a fun job. So just being like being really proactive and engaged is like super important, I think. I think there's also a real mystique about film and television and working in it. And it's, you know, of course, you know, there are lots of challenges and and lots of expertise needed. But in general, it's about people who are able to communicate with each other, to listen to each other, to um, have, you know, you know, maybe enjoy watching and having an opinion about a film or a television programme. And um, it's about being able to get up in the morning at a certain time, be on time, be professional at work. It, the attributes that, that lead to success in film and TV are very basic, straightforward attributes that I would imagine that every single person listening to this has. Yeah. And actually, you know, the confidence thing. Um, when I first started working on Outlander a couple of years ago, I was really scared to go into the production office. It's such a huge beast of a place. And, it, you know, I was really nervous. And I think that's the thing. We, we all know what that feeling is like. Every job we go on to, you know, you've never worked with that team of people before. You have to hit the ground running. You know, I'm, you know, I've been 30 years, gosh, more than 30 years in the industry. And I still feel as nervous on my first day on something as I did probably when I was a runner. And I kind of wouldn't want to change that because that means that I still am trying. I still want to learn to do the very best. Um, so, you know, don't don't worry. You know, I think as Ryan's saying, you, you'll have clearly loads of transferable skills. And I think as everybody's saying, in general, everybody working in, in the industry is nice and supportive and remembers what it was like when we all started as well. We've got another question in. Uh, what productions are running in Scotland at the moment? Wales is currently incredibly busy shooting multiple TV shows and crews in high demand. On the other hand, Scotland looks fairly quiet when it comes to big budget productions. Is it just the lack of studio space? And then we are better than Wales, so we can put that aside straight away. You know, 
<laughs> yeah, well, well done Wales and Doctor Who and Casualty, but <laughs> well, there are a lot of big productions going um, on. You know, huge amount. I mean, you're, at the moment, you're, you're 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 associated with quite a big one. So tell us about that. Um, so I'm at the moment on Outlander, but also doing the kids drama at the moment, and um, there isn't enough crew. I mean, that's the bottom line, um, we are really really struggling to find crew. There's so much happening. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's brilliant. Wales are doing so, so busy, but but I think Scotland is equally busy, if not more. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's a really good time. You know, I don't want to ra- over raise expectations, but I think if ever there's a moment to want to move into film and TV, I think this is a moment, um, you know, where people are looking for for the new entrance into the industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo, I would echo that, you know, we've, just I, I can obviously only speak for IWC at, at this point, you know, but we've got probably about half a dozen new productions either just started or just about to start. Um and similarly, you know, there just doesn't see everybody see, you know, for having had the year that we've had and a lot of people not working at all, um everything has obviously kind of started up again and now it's you know you're battling. Um, to get the people to actually fill these roles on the on the productions, um, so it's it's definitely busy. You know, we're working on just you know to kind of answer the specific question. You know, we we're working on lots of big returning network series. Um, so like location, location, location. We've got Susan Kalman's Grand Day Out, um, Scotland's Home of the Year. Um, you know, these these are all kind of ongoing at the moment. Um, so there's, there's, we've certainly got lots of stuff on, and I know that all of the other indies in, in Glasgow are equally as busy. Um, you know, and, and also in, in Glasgow, um, a lot of the big kind of game shows and quiz shows are, um, are made out of Glasgow. So, you know, things like um, Impossible, and I think there's a new one coming out for Channel 4 called The Answer Chat, which was just um, recently filmed in Glasgow. Um, you know, and all the kind of big national lottery shows were, were filmed here as well. So there's there's tons of, of you know, big, big things on the go in the kind of quiz show world, factual world, drama world. Um, so, yeah, I think we're, we're very lucky. Oh, it's just the boys. I just pick up the boys. Sorry, Mick, I just, could I just pick up on a couple of questions that are in there that I've just noticed? I think there's a couple of questions of people who may be established in the industry, but maybe want to move into different roles, or maybe have left the industry and want to come back after having a family. Um, and, and I mean, I guess just to even use myself as an example, I, I, um, I did many things in both children's and in drama, but I only started being a training manager a couple of years ago, and I've now got what I think they call a portfolio career. So I duck and dive across a few different roles. And I think that's becoming more accepted in the industry. Um, and I think, you know, coming back from, you know, if you've been looking after elderly parents or, or looking after kids, you know, your, your valuable life experience will be hugely important. So you might not have the credits, but you'll have amazing life experience. Um, and I think a lot of the um, links that come out at the end of this will help you move um, move forward. And Eunice, I think we're going to maybe be working together very soon. So maybe we should just pick up and have a chat about you know what what your kind of aspirations are as well. Um, so yeah, so I think I think it's whether it's not just about at the moment. I think the industry is really looking for people who are coming into the industry as new entrants, but we're also absolutely looking at people coming back into the industry moving from one area into another and also um, conversion training which is in essence people coming from um, you know maybe from completely so what you know maybe you've been a travel agent and actually you could slot into working in the production office or you've been an event manager or a tool manager and you could be a location person so that I think there's a real appetite at, at all the different levels to slot people in. Um, sorry I just had a quick look at the questions there as well and I think there's, there's quite a few kind of directed um, at me just about various different things. Um, all I was going to say was if um, I'm assuming our um, website addresses and everything are on that thing, I think they are. But yeah. my my own email address is on the IWC website in the work with us 
um, section. So if anybody does want to get in touch directly with me um, to talk about CVs or a wee bit of advice, and I think there was a couple of kind of career changers in there as well, and I'm very, very happy to do that. Um, and, you know, we can we can chat further. So if you, if you go on to the IWC website, you'll get my own email address. That'd be brilliant. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Laura. And I think it's important because this has been such a, a rotten year in many ways um, that some people will be thinking, right, is, is it, you know, is the industry up here because it's further away from London, you know, going to be hit worse than other areas? And I personally, because I'm working for a company that's pitching to London all the time, pitching to America, um, I've been in a situation where we've not stopped working through the lockdown. We were filming through the lockdown. We were doing ob docs through the lockdown. Um, you know, we're filming in France, Colombia, America through the lockdown on uh, productions varying from Killing Escobar, the film that went out the other night on BBC Scotland, to, you know, uh, the, uh, Escape to the Chateau. And so things are still being made. And it feels as though, um, you know, there is more programmes and more companies and more and more commissions coming out of the nations and regions by far. Now we've heard this, people that have been in television for a long while have heard promise of more coming out of Scotland and it's never quite arrived. But I personally think it really is happening now. And, you know, when you look at the different companies, you know, and the, the volume of production that's in Scotland and it's, you know, there's loads coming out of BBC and this, this, the studio there. STV has got its new Channel 4 drama, Screws. There's the big submarine drama being filmed in Edinburgh at the moment from the makers of Line of Duty. Um, that may have a more fun ending, I'm not sure. Um, so it's a wee bit... <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> Jed Mercurial will just tweet at me for, <laughs> for weeks. <laughs> but um, so And also you look at daytime, you know, like... And uh, what we call shoulder peak, you know, that kind of early uh, tea time thing, you know, there's loads coming out of Scotland, yeah, homes under the hammer, antiques, road trip, location, location, um, raise the roof, make, you know, Kirsty and Phil, um, love it or list it, or I like to call it like it or lump it, that'd be the Scottish version. <laughs> um, and BBC Social, there's far more content coming online as well, and BBC Scotland Channel is making loads of new series like Inside Central Station and, you know, Home, Home of the Year's fantastic. So it does feel as though there's a lot out there, you know, and there's a lot of jobs. And I would say, I think people think we get completely, uh, you know, we're lost under a, a swathe of CVs. But actually, I don't get many CVs, you know, and it's I'd, I'd be happy to see more. And we're desperately, desperately, desperately looking for more people who want to come up with ideas. And Ryan, I was going to talk to you because I think some people forget that actually television uh, feeds off of coming up with ideas for television. And development is often forgotten. You know, I've, I've, I was the head of development at STV for a while and people used to say, I didn't think that was a thing, just coming up with ideas for television as though they just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, there was a slot there with location said three times. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ryan, what do you think of people that, you know, getting into the world of just coming up with ideas and being able to pitch and what they should do? Yeah, I think, like, if if you've got really good ideas and stuff, then finding any way in to a TV and the or even at the BBC and stuff like that is is a good first step because the 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 notion of you being able to just sort of pitch an idea, you pitching an idea to like someone in the BBC and stuff is really difficult to manage because the the way that they commission stuff has to go through certain processes. So like getting um like ideas like that on spec you basically just like you can't even like read it because it, then that idea is getting made by another part of the broadcaster or by an indie and stuff like that then you could sort of almost claim that that idea has been stolen so like to 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 go through the bbc pitch thing is you need to have like an agent and you need to be quite established and stuff but a much better idea is to get into an indie become pally with the dev team, like be interested in the stuff they're working on and then try and get out and shoot some tasters with them. Get You know, th that's one way to get in and start generating your own, own ideas. I think like the the bread and butter of any company is the ideas that come from the dev team. Like without the dev team, 
there's you know there's no future commissions so there's so much pressure on them to have good ideas and so like if you're kind of coming and you maybe think that you don't watch that much tv then it might mean that you're watching stuff that is really relevant for say an audience that's quite difficult to reach so like for a younger audience certainly so like if you're quite clued into stuff and you're thinking about all the people that you watch on youtube and all that kind of stuff the people who work in have been working in indies and at the BBC and stuff like for 20, 30 years might not have a clue who any of those people are. So like certainly on the social, <laughs> like <laughs> I, I've been on the social for like five years and I'm like 32 now and I feel completely out of touch sometimes when like people are talking about TikTok stars and things like that. I'll, I can, so it, there's so much value in that stuff that you might be watching casually and there's so many ideas that come from that. And you can see how now there's things that, have translated from people pitching ideas like the um, not your average influencer that's um i think that was made by hannah curry and she she pitched that and she had some documentaries made that's about some tiktok stars and it was it that went out in bbc scotland it's just a really good idea and a really good um sort of influences that are on tiktok and big and stuff so like if you 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 should watch lots of things on tv but you should also draw from your own experiences and stuff that you're interested in because a lot of time, like, there might have been formats that have been done a million times, but the, what's that new spin, what's that new thing you can bring to it? So certainly for the social, like, we, again, we live and sort of breathe on getting new ideas from people and the, the sort of translation from that into TV thing has, has sort of happened already. So there's some guys that um, came and they've just done, I think they're making a second series of Roaming in the Wild. And it's a sort of like um like a wildlife show, but quite it's quite like weird and quirky and stuff. And they came to the social, actually, this is kind of embarrassing. My dad actually found them on a <laughs> on a website because he loves wildlife stuff and he found their YouTube channel and sent it to me. So I, I'll take credit for it now, but it was actually my dad found them. And they started making videos for the social, and then that an idea that they made like with, with us, we sort of pitched it as a TV show. So that process isn't exactly a quick one, but it does it does happen. And you start sort of seeing other people who've kind of worked on the social as well, who've kind of come with documentary ideas and they've maybe like sort of got their um, their foot in the door that way. And then they pitch the bigger idea. So there's um, a filmmaker called Camelia Kazan and she came in and was making short documentaries for us, maybe like four or five minute pieces. She actually filmed a piece with Lawrence Cheney, who won Drag Race recently. That's that's a claim claim to fame. And then she then got a thirty minute doc about the um, the Roma community in in, in Govan Hill made for the BBC Scotland channel. She's like a new filmmaker, documentary filmmaker. So yeah, having I think like don't expect to just pitch an idea and have it made instantly, but think of different ways you can kind of get ideas to the right people but it's it, it's not as easy as just sort of sending a, a like a an email to a commissioner and they'll just like commission this like it's like it can be quite a complicated process but there's, there are ways to do it completely and th another thing to remember is no idea is born beautiful so it may be worth getting in touch with a com uh, an independent production company that knows uh, that has got experience in making that type of program and talking with the dev people and get them battering back and forward into a shape that actually is suited to the channel or the you know the, the website that is going to go on. Now we're just about to um, uh, come to an end of this session but I do one quick question for you all um, if you could ask to answer quickly and it's, it's one of those huge questions it's hard to answer quickly it is if you had one piece if somebody could have given you one piece of advice when you were starting out in television what would it have been? And you know, what do would you think you wish what would you really wish you'd known at the beginning that you know now? Sarah, how would you like to go with that one? Well, would you come to me last? <laughs> okay, no, <Sarah>. right. <laughs> Ryan, you're closest <laughs> to your beginning of your, your Yeah, I thought you know, the, <laughs> I, I, was, I wish message. somebody would just have told me there will be a thing called the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um the, if I would give myself the same advice that I got on the first day which is the best piece of advice I got working with TV was the coordinator that I was sort of basically shadowing as a production secretary she said that you get an hour for lunch every day don't ever not take it because you'll never get that time back and you don't get you basically are like losing money not that it's all about money and stuff but the, the sort of core principle that you get lunch take it because there's a real bad practice in TV a lot where yeah. people just work through their break 
And by the end of the day, they're totally burst because they've not had a break. And it's, it's just really important that you actually take time. But if there's a cult, it can sometimes feel quite like weird. There's a culture that you have to work all the time. You have to work through your break and stuff. But I've never not taken my break. And I'm proud of it. Down to the minute on the hour, I'll go for a walk outside. But honestly, it makes such a difference. You clear your head and you come back. And that issue you're having, now you've got you've sort of thought it through and you had a bit of time to reflect on it. It's, it makes such a big difference. So yeah, take your, take your hour lunch break. <laughs> Laura, what do you think? Um, I mean, I was in a slightly different situation because my first job in TV was actually a staff job. But when that came to an end, I think it's just, there will always be another job. You know, I think people get really scared you know because there's a lack of security with the kind of freelance nature of our industry um but I think it's just really important to remember that there will be another job I promise <laughs> there will be another job um and not to not to freak <laughs> yeah I think not to freak is the best piece of advice yeah. <laughs> we'll freak out. Ever, evergreen advice <laughs> I think for me, it's, um, so I went, I applied for a training scheme um, back in the 1988, and I was told that I would never succeed in the film, film and television industry, um, and I didn't get the training role, um, and I was told that in the interview face to face, which clearly is completely inappropriate, um, mm -hmm. but um, with my advice from that one, don't give up if you really want it don't give up. You know, you won't get every job. You might even get an answer to every email you send. But if you really want it and it genuinely is what you want to do, don't give up. And, and actually be, come and come to this as you know, you're on the journey because you're already engaged. It's going to be really useful for you. And I suppose the other thing is, is don't be projecting, which kind of ties into what Laura's saying a bit. Don't be thinking of what is, is going to be in 10 years, five years, even two years. Kind of go with the flow. Just, you know, at, you know, come get into the industry, see if you like it. You might love it. You might hate it. Um, you can change, potentially change careers when you're in it. Um, but don't worry too much and look after yourselves, I suppose. The, the enterprise thing, you know, look after yourself. Completely. Yourself. Completely. And um, so thanks very much um, to you all for um, working over your lunch break, Ryan. <laughs> I, did, but I had my lunch. I had my lunch at... 12 o'clock. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, but thanks very much for um, sharing your time and knowledge and experiences today. Uh, just to let you know, a lot of people were asking about, you know, will this info be on, you know, available baths of Scotland have prepared a TV in Scotland info sheet. If you tick the box when registering to receive more info, um, BAFTA will send it automatically after this se session. If you didn't because you thought you were going to get spam mail or something like that, then please send an email to infoscotland, all one word, at BAFTA.org. That's infoscotland at BAFTA.org, and they'll send it on. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Please do join the conversation on BAFTA's social channels using the hashtag, hashtag Guru Live. And thanks very much for joining us. And thanks again to everybody again. And good luck at starting up out in telly. All right, cheers now. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.